So for onliners, yes, we are open to the public, so please feel free to drop by our church. However, please be aware that restrictions in California are really tight, so don't be surprised when you walk inside this church or again this area. It's very tight, and uh, people have been trying to you know, crucify us. So because of that, uh, you, uh, just be aware of that when you come here. This is verse by verse, literally word for word, Bible study. So as I explain each and every verse, try to pay attention and try to understand each and every word yourself, okay, rather than just hearing me. Try to understand each and every word yourself and then see if my explanations and teachings can complement the verse that you're reading. By doing that, then you can independently grow yourself and understand the wording of the Bible, especially for people who see the Bible as something hard to understand at the beginning. But that's because you're a baby Christian at that stage. By the time you get a gist of what the Bible reading is like, you're going to be surprised how easy it is to understand the Bible. Okay, let's turn to Genesis chapter 1, please. And uh, we left off at verse 26, verse 26. God's epitome of creation, and that is man, man. So God created man in his own image, the Bible says. Okay, so we're going to look at Genesis chapter 1 and then uh, verse 26, okay? So the Bible says here, and God said, so God is speaking, let us make man in our image. So God says, let us make man in our image. Now that's important to see because what you're going to realize is that when God's speaking here, he didn't say, I'm going to make man. Mm -hmm. He says, let us. Why is that? Because this is absolute proof of the Trinity yeah. at place. Yeah. So there is a Trinity at work. Yeah. So it is important to understand that God, when he is who he is, he is a Trinity. Now, we're going to look at some passages here. If we see let us make man in our image, God is speaking and he refers to himself as us, then that means God is a trinity. But some people don't believe that. They say, no, what it's speaking here is that when God says let us make man in our image, that that is referring to angels. So God says, let us make man in our image, the, the angels. But the problem with that reading then is that you're attributing the angels for creating man in the image. God says, let us make man. So God is the one who creates and makes man. It's not angels. That's very clear proof of the Trinity there. And not only that, if you look at verse 27, it says, so God created man in what? His own image. So notice here that when God is talking about at verse 27, uh, 26, let us make man in our image, the Bible shows that it's referring to God's image. God alone. It's not referring to angels. He's not including angels here. So this is absolute proof of the Trinity. So for Old Testament Jews who do not believe in a Trinity... Here's your Old Testament verse, the very first chapter. Very first chapter. It will prove that God is a trinity. So trinity, meaning uh, tri and unity. One God, three persons. Thus there's a plural inside a singular term. So this is absolute proof of the trinity that you might want to know. Trust me, you want to know that because the trinity is a hot topic issue now, recently. If we look at the next part of verse 26, it says, after our likeness. So God wants to create man after his own image, after his likeness, similar to him, like him. Keep reading. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. So then notice that God says, let them have dominion. So why does he say them here? Because he's going to mention at the next part of verse 27, male and female created he them. See that? So him is referring to the man, them is referring to male and female. So male and female, basically it's referring to humanity. That's the idea. So God is speaking about 
humanity in general. It, whenever you look at the word in your Bible where it says and talks about man, quite often it will be referring to a general sense as humans. So a lot of times they can refer to as humans. So you've got to understand that fact. A lot of times the Bible will use the term he. And then when it uses the term he, it's actually referring to humanity in general. Basically, women can be included in that passage. So the idea is to understand that's actually how it's done in Old English. Old English, when they referred to humanity in general, it was very common that they would use masculine terms. You might say, well, that's very politically incorrect. I don't like that. Yeah, that's why we change our English language. And that's the reason why people don't realize. Now, I don't know if you know this, but... Uh, Man is created after the image of God, and the woman is created after the image of man. That's the thing that some people don't understand. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Well, actually, yeah, we'll go here right now. Okay, I was going to do it later, but let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. A lot of people don't understand this, where they look up passages in the Bible... And they don't understand why God would say that saved Christians are in his image. And that's actually used in the masculine term. The reason why is because the reason why it's in the masculine term is that God is a male. He's not a female. See, you've got to understand that fact. To try to put female and male into a uh, j just uh, God's own image in that sense is to make God some kind of uh, yin and yang thing, male and female thing, which is what I don't agree with. God has to be completely masculine. That's his own image. It's completely masculine. Nothing female in it. So then uh, if females are created, then what are they created after? They are created after the image of man. Now I'm going to show you careful wordings here. First of all, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, notice what the Bible says at verse 11, uh, verse 7, verse 7, excuse me. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the what? Image and glory of God, right? Man is God's image and glory. What about the woman? But the woman is the what? Glory of the man. See that? God puts but here. He has to separate the woman. Why? Because God is not a female. He makes that very clear. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Now, living in the Bay Area, I know this is uh, giving you a little bit of tension, and some of you have the uneasy feeling right now, but that's okay. That's natural. That's good for you. You need to clear out those drugs called liberalism and feminism. You need to clear that out, okay? And I know it's a shock at the beginning, but then just get a little bit more used to the Bible. You'll become immune to it. And you'll be happy that you became sober and that you just got free from drugs. All right. Go to the book of Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. It's common sense. How was Eve created? God did not create Eve and Adam like at the same time like this. From his own image. When God created man after his own image, he put his power, his image into man. Uh, we're going to see that chapter two. He breathed into them, him. But then the woman, how did he create the woman? He created the woman out of the man. See, so look at verse 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. See that? It's from man. It's not from God. If you, uh, we're going to look back at, you can look at that yourself at chapter two, verse seven real quick. But we're going to go there later on today. But see, God created man himself from his own power. But then the woman was from the man himself that God created the woman. That's why verse 23, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called what? Woman. Why? Because she was taken out of man. So that's why it's woman. And now we're getting to a day and age where people don't like the word woman. Why? Because they realize that. It's from the man. How about that? Some people don't realize that. So it's important to understand that 
A woman is created from the man. Now let's go back at chapter 1. Now look at the wording here. Look at the wording here. He says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Now, if you notice that here, God says, let us make man in our image. Some people might think that if the latter part of verse 26, it says, let them have dominion, right? So it's referring to humanity in general. So then if it's referring to humanity in general, then when God says, let us make man in our image at the first part of verse 26, it would make sense. It would include male and female, which is a fair point. I can see that. However, the thing is, is that if you look at how the King James Bible is worded carefully, he says, let us make man in our image. He puts man after the image of God, but then he puts them as the ones who are ruling. He never says it's created after his image. If you look at verse 27 again, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. But look at the next part, male and female created he them. Did you see that separation there? See, God made a very clear separation. So then God says that at uh, verse 26, 27, I have to go word for word so that you guys don't get lost. I apologize. But let me summarize and then I'll try to read every word for word. So the point is here is that notice that at verse 27, he specifically worded that God created man in his own image. And he said it again, man after his own image, he created him. But then he separated that creation of after his image of man to male and female created he them. Why did he do that? He could have just easily just put uh, man and woman created in the image of God. But no, he said, I created man in my image, and then he made it separate, distinct, male and female, created he them. So it's important to understand that after the image of God, why do I believe that strongly? One, because God wants to make it very clear he, is, he has nothing to do with female. That's what the Eastern religions do with that yin and yang, male and female thing. God wants to make it very clear there. Number two, it's because the definition of a female or woman, female, from male, woman, from man, and that's defined in Genesis 2. Genesis 2. That's what Adam pointed out. And 1 Corinthians 11, I don't know how you're going to overrule that one. 1 Corinthians 11 says man is created after the image of God, but the woman, contrast, is after the man. That's pretty clear. Okay, let's go back to Genesis 1, and let me read it word for word now. The Bible says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So we understand that part. And let them have dominion. So then what is humanity, mankind in general, have dominion over, have rulership over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle? So they have uh, control over the animals that are in the sea, in the air, birds, and then cattle as well. And then over all the earth, that's everything in the world, everything in the earth that mankind is in charge of. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that's everything that creepeth, creeps on the earth. So those are insects. Now, if you look at verse 27, so God created man in his own image. We understand that part. In the image of God created he him. So in other words, God created man after his own image, God's own image, God created Adam. Male and female created he them. And then God created Adam and Eve together. So notice, it's important to note at verse 26, mankind, what kind of uh, dominion and rulership do they have? It's toward, notice this is over all the earth. Now, think about it. In God's six days of creation... Why didn't God just give mankind control over all of his creation? Now, I don't know if you uh, misheard me or misunderstood me. You might say, well, no, pastor, mankind has control over all of God's creation. It did not. It actually says over there that what did they have control? They have control. Okay, I am going to erase his head. All right, he looks like an alien, not a man. Okay. <laughs> so then if you actually look at... 
That verse again, read verse 26, it says over where? All the where? Earth. That's important. Mankind, they didn't have control, notice, over, for example, day number two, the firmament. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. And then also uh, day number four, where the sun, moon, and stars at. Mankind does not have that control or dominion. Look at Genesis chapter 11 and Isaiah 14. Genesis chapter 11 and Isaiah chapter 14. Genesis chapter 11 and Isaiah chapter 14. Notice mankind does not have dominion or control. That's why they strive to attain and control. That's why mankind tries to say that they have a NASA. That's why mankind will boast and brag that they said we landed on the moon, or so they claim. Mankind, they will say that we've got satellites up in there. Why? Mankind wants to reach up there. But God, he doesn't give control. If we look at Genesis chapter 11, notice God does not approve of that. God does not like that. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 3. And they said one to another, go to let us make brick and burn them Truly, and they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they say, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Obviously, God did not approve of that. Who tries to do that? Isaiah 14. That's satanic. That's a satanic spirit. Doesn't matter how ma much mankind thinks how great Elon Musk is in trying to build up stuff that would try to hit the moon or Mars or et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's his, that was supposedly his goals for 2021. So we have yet to see. He's supposed to launch something at October. So I don't know what's going to happen. But if we look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which this week in the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. All right, let's return to our main text, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. So we can see clear as day that God does not approve about mankind trying to populating throughout outer space. But see, Satan wants mankind to achieve that. Why is that? We're not going to turn over there, but at Revelation 12... Satan and his minions tries to attack the God's angelic beings right there at the second heaven, up there at the universe where space is located. So we see here that at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27, God limits mankind's control down here, not up there. Let's go to verse 28. And God blessed them. So God obviously blessed man and woman. And God said unto them, be fruitful. So God wants man and woman to be fruitful and multiply. He wants them to multiply. So fruitful, the idea is, it's, it's like the other context of his other parts of creation. When you go back at verse 9 through 13, it goes all the way over there. There's a relationship. There's a relationship that God sees. Why? It's because it's a common designer. The common designer, when vegetation get, reproduces, that's the key, reproduces at verse 11, it says the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. Verse 12, tree yielding fruit. Seed was in itself. So you see these terms here. The terms are seed and fruit. That's why you're going to notice throughout your Bible where it talks about reproducing that these labels will be used. So that's pretty normal. That's why God says to mankind, be fruitful and multiply. If you look at verse 22, remember God told the uh, animals of the sea and flying in the air, be fruitful and multiply. Why? It goes all the way back to vegetation. So notice that there is a connection, a relationship here, starting with vegetation, then with animals and man. So then Richard Dawkins is stupid enough to say, so there's no doubt you see a classification 
set up for some strange reason where vegetation life over here, animal life over here, and then human life up there. So this proves that we're all related. What he means by related is ancestor-wise, where he's talking about the tree reproducing man, if you give it like uh, millions or billions of years, how many years that they might add to that. But when I talk about, yes, there is a relationship, there is a kinship, there is a connection. The connection is God. He created all of that. Uh, remember, a, if you look at the handwork of created objects or pictures and etc., if you see a commonality or relationship between them, it doesn't mean one painting gave birth to another, poof, like that. What it means is that there was a, it's a sign of a common traits of a common designer. That's just common sense in create created works. That's just common sense. A lot of people overlook that fact. So uh, we must understand that when Richard Dawkins said, oh man, scientists just discovered this. You're too slow, man. Give it about almost 6,000 years ago. God wrote it down at Genesis 1. Genesis 1, all the way over there. God, God already saw the order that way. He, because why? That, those are his days of creation. Now, if we want to debunk evolution again, we return to verse 27. It says, male and female created he them. Now, that's really important. The thing that can really stomp out evolution is where you get male and female. Male and female. I mean, you got to think about this. If things just naturally evolve throughout time, then why is it mainly... Now, I know there might be a few exceptional cases like the seahorse, for example, but why is it mainly where it can come down to male and female. Why does it come down to that point? Mainly throughout cre creation itself. I mean, you got to realize that this is something that you can tell that there's a mind behind it that deliberately put it that way. Right. I mean, what are the chances it comes out male and female throughout billions? I mean, you, you got to be crazy. Millions of years? Just those two? You got to think about that. Here's another thing. Reproduction is absolutely essential for survival. So if reproduction is absolutely essential for survival, then how can you do that with the evolving process if evolution takes long spans of time to become male and female? And then you have to have the, the male and female where just somehow with di uh, different beings or different substances that somehow have the right connection and fit together in unity to reproduce something. How do you do that? See, it makes more sense. It makes more sense to say that it was intelligent design. So this is another argument against evolution. Now you notice Genesis 1 is filled with arguments against evolution. It's Genesis 1 alone. <clears throat> Returning to our main text, Verse 28, God blessed Adam and Eve, man and woman, and said unto them, God said to both Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. So God told them to basically reproduce. And notice he says here, and replenish the earth and subdue it. So God says that mankind in general have to subdue, have to subdue. Notice that the context is throughout the earth again. But he says the word replenish. Did you notice that? Now, why do you want to know the word replenish? Why is that important? Not really a big deal. It is a big deal because it once more points out the Genesis gap. So we're going to see two pointers here on why this points out the Genesis gap. The first part is, notice it says replenish. Did you notice that? And that's just common sense. If you actually look up even modern dictionaries today, even modern dictionaries will show you that replenish is mostly, even mostly or prioritized as to fill again. Fill again. So some of them won't tell you that. Now some people who want to try to debunk the gap theory, they'll say, well, if you look at old English dictionaries, it's mostly used for fill. That's how they'll argue back. Well, the thing is this, is that if God wanted to say fill, he could have said fill, but he didn't. If you look at verse 22, what did he say to the fowls of the air and the fish of the sea? Verse 22, and God blessed them saying, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the water. Did he say replenish or fill? He said fill, 
So notice if God means fill, he'll say fill. And if he says replenish, he'll say replenish. Amen, brother. So he makes the distinction there. He says replenish. Look at the word with Noah later on at Genesis 9. He says he tells him to replenish. Why? Because the former population was wiped out. By the way, here's another one. Okay, look at the book of Exodus chapter 1. All they have to do is look at the first chapters of the first two books of the Bible. Look at Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. Now, notice that God, he'll know when to use fill and when he'll use replenish. So replenish, we see that this is basically a second time thing. It's a second time thing. And then for fill, this is something that's done for the first time. Now notice that God will make that distinction. We're going to look at the book of Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied. Now, if you go back to Genesis 1, is it verse 28? It says, Fruit, be fruitful and multiply. And the next word should be replenish, right? Mm -hmm. So God is using the same idea as Exodus 1, 7. Be fruitful, multiply, so the next one should be replenish. And wax exceeding mighty, and the land was, oops, filled with them. Why? This is the first time that the Jews filled out the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 1. It's not the second time that they did. Otherwise, God would have done replenish. So see, God knows what he's saying. All right, let's go back to Genesis 1. Genesis chapter 1. Another example on, oh, by the way, if you actually look up for replenish, uh, I just have to uh, pull up other arguments. A lot of people, they've been trying to debunk me you know, trying to paint me out a heretic for one of these teachings and etc. But some of these people, they just lack knowledge or study themselves. The point is, is that even just that word replenish, I don't have time to expound. And in my first video on Genesis, I didn't have time to expound. I referred you all to uh, please watch the video, The Gap Theory. That would probably be the best comp uh, comprehensive list. But that's not even my best. And I did that video from memory too. OK, if you got me to research and dig up sources, you might be in trouble. OK, so be careful before you shoot out your mouth. These are the same people who are not pastors, who don't lead and guide ministries. And it makes you wonder if they're actually uh, what are they? Are they just losers at home and they're in their pajamas? And how long how old are their clothes now? OK, so watch out for these people. Now, if we go back to Genesis chapter one. And when we look at verse 28 again, where it says replenish, you got to realize that if you look up the word replenish, it can come from, it actually comes from the Latin. And then the Latin word where it talks about that word replenish, the majority of the times, you know what it refers to? It refers to fill again. And even Bible scholars know this, that the King James Bible, that it... Uh, it get a lot of its translation from Latin. It went from Hebrew, then to Greek, then to Latin, and then to English. That's how it went throughout history there. The King James Bible, why it's such a... The Bible scholars, hence, they'll try to make the King James Bible weak. So it didn't really come from the original Hebrew and Greek. No, what makes it superior is that it's a... Commun it's, a it's such a comprehension. It takes all the manuscripts combined together. So where the majority of Greek manuscripts miss out something, the old Latin will make up for it. And where the old Latin misses out on something, then the majority Greek text will cover it. So the King James Bible takes all the manuscripts out there. That's just a basic knowledge of manuscript evidence. So, but anyway, I can't stay stuck at 28. We gotta go on, right? So at the next part of verse 28, we see here that God tells them to replenish the earth and subdue it. So they have control, man and woman. Another pointer for the gap theory is this. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over, look at this, every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now notice that mankind in general has control over everything. 
that goes on in the earth. Every living thing. They have dominion over the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, and any living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now, if it's literally every living thing that moveth upon the earth, then you got to realize this. No wonder there is this creature somewhere who is not happy. This creature, go to Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Go to Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. This creature is not happy. Why? Because this creature, his domain has been taken over by a being that's weaker than him. Now notice that Satan cannot have control. Did you notice that? Mankind has control over everything. Well, then if that's the case, then there's a issue here. Satan, he did have control over the earth, and this is during his fall, all right? So this is even before mankind's fall. So then where are you going to put the space, where are you going to put the time situation of Lucifer's fall? The only logical place that you can put it is before the creation of man. It's before the six days of creation. If you insist that, well, Lucifer... Uh, he had control over the earth that, that time. I, I acknowledge that. Well, when he had control over the earth, that was during his fall, you got to realize. It was before his fall. And you got to realize in the six days of creation, God says that everything he made was good. So you can't put sin or something corruptible within that timeline, within the six days of creation. Well, if you can't put the fall of Lucifer any time within the six days of creation, what about after that? No stinking way because the serpent was there tempting mankind. It was So then the only logical sense is what? Before. That's why it makes sense. Genesis 1, verses 1 and, uh, verse 2, 1 and 2, there's a gap there. Now look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Okay, this is the time where Lucifer fell, the fall of Lucifer. When he fell, what did he do before? Before, verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. That means he's below heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That means he's living below the stars of God. He says, exalt my throne. See that? So he has a throne, but he wants to exalt it. He wants to lift it above the stars. So his throne right now is currently below the stars. Well, actually, in this text, what I mean by right now, currently in this text, he's below the stars. Where do you think he's at then? It's pretty apparent, but if you want me just to keep reading, I'll keep reading. <laughs> I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the what? Heights of the clouds. He's below the clouds. That's proof. Lucifer was ruling on the earth. Now go to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. And then we'll read verse 12. Verse 12. Now look, uh, I know that there are some sensitive onliners who are going to bring up some kind of Kent Hovind arguments and etc., I've studied all the gap theory arguments. Basically, they'll mention about uh, Exodus 20. In six days, the Lord God created everything, etc. And they'll bring up other arguments. Look, uh, instead of uh, just spurting out whatever you're prone to believe in and then arguing, why don't you study the scriptures first? Do the fair share. I keep referring you to the gap theory video. Major I, I bet you majority of the videos just did that without watching and studying the scriptures. Look, why bother watching our video and our channel uh, for studying the scriptures to find truth if you're not prone to do that? All right, look at Ezekiel chapter 28. We're going to look at verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of what? Tyrus. So this is a being who has rulership and control. He's called king of Tyrus. Who is this person? It's Satan, because look at verse 14. Thou art the what? Anointed cherub that coverest. Look at verse 15. That's apparently Satan. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created 
till iniquity was found in thee. See, there's no doubt. That's referring to Lucifer. That's Satan. But look where he was at during his fall. This whole context is his fall, right? But look at verse 13. Thou hast been in what? Eden, Eden the garden of God. Look at that. So notice that he was on the earth undoubtedly. He was on the earth undoubtedly during his fall. He was in Eden, but then God just put man in there. You don't think he's mad? Of course he's mad. He is not a happy camper, let's just say. Okay? He is not a happy camper. And then also we got to realize that Ezekiel chapter 28 here and verse 13, he was on the earth. This was during his fall and he had rulership. He had control. A lot of people don't look at the text. Okay, let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And then we'll read verse 29. We'll read verse 29. So it's apparent that Satan, he had control over the earth. That's one. Number two is that he had control over the earth before his fall. Number three, there's no other time period that you can put it at. The only time period that would make sense is before the six days of creation. Okay, returning back to the main text. Let's go to the Verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth. So God says to mankind, I've given you every herb that has seed and it's all throughout the surface of the earth the face of the earth you see that that's the idea and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed so every single tree out there which is what i drew here in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed they all have fruits and it has seed in it to you it shall be for meat so it's their food that was mankind's food now notice that the word it says meat now, notice that when the Bible says meat here, that's not obviously referring to steak, or it's referring to kalbi, or it's referring to teji bulgogi, or it's referring to a barbecue. So the Bible defines itself. It says it's referring to fruit and vegetables here. So the vegetation here. So believe it or not, mankind is originally a vegetarian, all right? So all the fruits, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make it more specific. I'm going to write vegetables here, okay? And fruits. So with vegetables and fruits, we were all vegetarians. And then notice that animals too. So before the environment... Mentalists were weeping about mankind eating animals and then you know you see these horrible scenes of lions You know eating Bambi or something like that, you know And the women start crying and some of the men even start crying, you know Oh, what a horrible world that we live in originally it was not intended to be that way. All right All right, the environmentalists see they just want to attain that world without God, but it's impossible Survival don't work that way. You will not survive that way it has to be on God's terms at a pure paradise. Because of the sin of mankind, we fell away from that. So then, the, uh, to be honest environmentalists, we Christians are true environmentalists because we strive and we look forward to the day when all of mankind, there's no death out there. And then both mankind and creatures and even the earth itself, the plants and vegetation will all be very happy. All right, we're all very unhappy right now with liberalism and control and trying to do things their own ways. Why? Because the earth is imbalanced and we're not in function and everybody comes out weird and crazy now. You know, because we're trying to, oh, we got to do something to survive. You can't do it out of your own feats, your own efforts. Look at verse 30. And to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air. So every beast that's on the earth, every bird that flies up in the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, every insect, wherein there is life, God gives them life. Look at this. I have given every green herb for meat. See, they were all vegetarians. And it was so. And it came to pass. God made it that way. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if we go to Isaiah chapter 11, we get a little example here. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. 
So one day in the future, the Lord will create that kind of paradise. We're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 11. And then we'll read verse 7. We'll read verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 and 7 for context. Isaiah chapter 11. And then uh, we'll read verses 6 through 7. So notice that the Bible reads that there's going to be a timeline called the millennium. And that's going to be the future. And it's going to imitate and be similar to like how he did with mankind originally at the Garden of Eden. All right, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 11, and then notice at verse 6, the Bible reads, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. That's your paradise. That's similar to Adam and Eve. Like, imagine your little children riding on a leopard, and you, and you mothers don't have to worry about that. You mothers don't have to freak out and get a heart attack whenever you go to the zoo. Look at that cute little bear. Isn't that cute? Oh, that's cute. And then when the child tries to touch it, you go, don't do that. And you get scared. You give the opposite effect. Instead, you can say, oh, it's cute, even when the child pets the bear. Amen. Man, that's going to be something. And then notice that verse 7, and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Imagine that. See? Everyone's going to be a vegetarian. All right. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. So this is going to be a pure paradise that we're going to have once more. The Lord's going to reinstate everything in a beautiful manner. You notice that uh, humanism... Liberals and even the Republicans and all the world, the Catholic Church and even apostate Christian churches today, this is the kind of kingdom they're trying to bring themselves. So then you'll get apostate ecumenical pastors who will join the liberal crowd in like uh, the climate change, global warming, uh, raising up funds for that and then raising up funds for saving the animals and then uh, raising up funds concerning more about diversity and inclusion and etc cetera, etc cetera. but see this is all mankind doing it out of their own feats and their efforts and see god don't approve of that let's look at verse let's look at genesis chapter 1 and verse 31 and god saw everything that he had made so everything god made and behold it was very good so behold means look and look it was very good that's the idea so Everything God makes, if you just actually behold around you, if you just look around you, you'd realize what a great God. Even in this fallen state yeah. that this world is in, there's still so many beautiful places. It's amazing. I mean, in Sodom and Gomorrah here, even uh, San Francisco Bay Area, there's, it's so many beautiful places to see, believe it or not. Why? That's, that's the amazing handiwork of God dis in spite of mankind's greatest yeah. sin. Sodom and Gomorrah being a wicked city that it is, it still had very beautiful plains that Lot saw. Why? This is God's creation that he can make. And notice that God's creation that he made is still very beautiful even after Noah's flood. That's your God. The last part of verse 31, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So all of this came about in 24 hours in the sixth day. Now there's an important note here. And I'm going to give you two wild theories, okay? So this is what you came for, right? <laughs> or if you didn't come, then now might be the right time to leave, I guess, you know? <laughs> this guy's crazy. All right. So I'm just only going to put this as theories, okay? And then I'm going to bring up one of these theories later on in the future. Okay, one, he says the sixth day there. The sixth day, if this happened at the sixth day, notice he said man and woman. Did you notice that? So then, in other words, wow, this is definitely intelligent design. God just created the animals like that. He can finish in less than an hour. And then with uh, Adam, less than an hour. But then he didn't create woman until after the man, right? We already read that at verse 22 and 23 of chapter 2, right? Woman was created later after man. But for some of you who don't know, if you look at verse 19, at verse 19, 
And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Adam named every biological species and all the classification systems before all the PhD scientists, which numbered the thousands, came up with their heads together. And you know how much time that they spent on just one living substance? Adam just went boom, 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 and boom, like that. Before woman was created, and woman was created at the same day that Adam was created. You know what that means then? That means then, this is a theory, but then this would show here that when Adam, that Adam named all the animals within probably half a day then. Half a day or less a day, than a day. He just did that like a computer. That's the intelligent design that God gave to mankind before. How about that? I mean, it did say he created man and woman. And then the next verse, it says the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So that's theory number one there. So that shows the intellect of mankind. Now, I'm going to give you theory number two, and I'm not too sure. I don't, even believe, I don't really believe this myself, to be honest. So this is just a theory. But I find some interesting notions here that when you look at chapter 1 and verse 28, God says, the last part, that mankind is in control, dominion over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God worded it at that manner. It might be an indication that there might be other living entities there. Because if we go to Genesis chapter 4, and then I'll expound that a little bit more. Genesis chapter 4. There is, a, uh, there is a controversy concerning about if Adam and Eve reproduce their children, and those children reproduce themselves, and those children reproduce, reproduce that way, then there definitely was incest going on. So that's a common argument that you'll hear from liberals. Well, the thing is this, is that it may be possible, I'm not sure if this is true or not, I'm not interested in debunking the liberal argument now. I did that a long time ago in my other videos, so I'm not going to expound on this one. But uh, what might be interesting is that it may, there may not have been what they might see as ancestral relations. There might have been other living entities or beings there. There could have been other living beings or entities there that came and then the descendants of Adam's intermingled with. The reason why is because, notice what Cain said, and during this time, it's only Cain and Abel this time. If you look at uh, Genesis chapter 4, and then verse 14, what did Cain say? Behold, thou hast driven me out, of, out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that Everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Who was living there? Who was living there? All right, go back to Genesis chapter 1. So there might have been other beings. Who are those other beings? It could be probably the fallen angels again. Came down again after Satan tempted uh, mankind. I mean, think about this, is that when Eve talked, she talked. She talked to Satan. She wasn't like surprised or in shock. She wasn't like surprised or in shock. She just took a normal conversation. Makes you wonder. Other, pe other beings that might have been roaming or living. But mankind was the king of the territory. And perhaps those other beings did not like that. And that's why they did something. Anyways, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. That's a crazy theory, all right? I didn't really delve into that, but we'll delve into it a little bit more, Genesis 4, maybe. So we're going to look at the next chapter 2 and verse 1. Thus, so, therefore, all right, in summary, out of everything in chapter 1, the heavens and the earth were finished. So God created all the heavens, plural, notice it's plural, why? Because he created the first and second heaven. So we saw that. It's referring to then the space and then up there in the skies. And then obviously the third heaven where God lives. So then God created the heavens and everything. It says the earth 
were finished. So God finished the earth and all the host of them, all the host within it. So usually when you look up the word host, it's referring to the stars, actually. It's referring to the stars or basically inhabitants of it, inhabitants. Interestingly, the word host, it has a connection with stars as well as another entity, angels. And then you're going to find out in your Bible that uh, angels have some connection with the stars too, which is very, very interesting. So looking at these factors here, we see hosts, angels, and then stars, that there's some kind of connection or relationship with these entities. We could see here that I have no idea, but perhaps at chapter 2, verse 1, it could be referring to, one, the totality of all his creation. So in other words, from the beginning of Genesis 1. Because the Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, that's not the six days of creation. We know that, right? Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God, what? Created the heaven and the earth. And then at chapter 2, verse 1, God is summarizing all the way from the beginning of verse 1 and onward. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. So in other words, you see here that it could be, it could be possibility one, where God's talking about a totality of everything, literally everything that he had created from in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth with Lucifer, the fallen beings, and then the creation of that time, as well as the six days of creation with uh, Adam. Or it could be that at chapter 2, verse 1, it's referring to basically the six days of creation. Because the host could be ref is a reference, it could be a reference to the stars, right? could be a reference to the stars. And then God mentioned at the third day, God called the dry land earth. And then the heavens, we could see that he did that at the second day. And then as well as uh, at the fifth day where he had those creatures flying. So then we see here that at chapter 2, verse 1, it could be where God created at chapter 2, verse 1, the six days of creation of everything. Or it could be a deeper picture. If, those, if the host is referring to the angels, then it will refer to chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to the end. Okay. Now, when God created everything, at verse 2, it says, And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. So God, why did he say, seventh day, I end my work? Everything he made. He didn't have to, okay, so number one, he didn't have to put a seventh day. He could have just said, sixth day, start with the first day again. So that shows there's something significant. Number two, why didn't he create anything on the seventh day? Why did he rest? Verse 3 is even more plain. There is absolutely no doubt God takes very special notice of the seventh day. Verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day. That's very plain. See, the seventh day, there's some reason. God puts a blessing on it and sanctified it. He made it holy because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So seven is important. Now, if you doubt this, then all you have to do is look throughout your Bible on the number seven. Look what he says about Sabbath or Sabbaths. And you're going to see a huge number of connections and doctrines, which I don't have time to turn to. I mean, that's where you can get your timing of the rapture, actually, which is very, very interesting about the seven ages. Now, uh, remember, I told you before that because we're going by human calendars, that because of human calendars today, we can't pinpoint an exact date. So I don't want people to misunderstand me on that one. However, the Bible gives you clues, and he mentions that there are times and seasons at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 where you can get an idea about the timetable of his rapture and his coming. If there, I mean, there's so many references to Sabbaths and Sabbath and Seventh Day, which is insanely crazy. The millennium, it is known as rested. The whole earth is at rest, just like the Garden of Eden. So that's why, which is very, I'm not going to get over there, but basically, if you might recall, my previous Genesis, I drew a pyramid, and for some weird reason, I put seven at the top. I don't know if you noticed that. 
There, there was a special reason for that. The special reason is because of God. God takes the number seven seriously. And then he makes everything go around seven. I mean, Leviticus is so plain. He goes at the seventh time, at the seven sevens, at the seven seven, then we're going to have a jubilee at something. It's so weird, you know. You just go, uh, or a special time, or a special day, he'll do it. And you go, why did God do that? <laughs> because he takes special notice of seven. So if you look at verse 2, seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. He finished his work that he made, and he rested on the seventh day. So he took a rest, he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he has made, from everything that he worked, that he made. So apparently the atheists were right that your God is not omnipotent and that he was very tired and exhausted after creating mankind. I was like, oh, that was so much hard work. And then he had to take a break on the seventh day. No, that's ridiculous. I mean, it's so ridiculous. I mean, the Bible showed at Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, all God had to do was breathe, and then mankind was created. Amen. So it's not, and then the stars, he knows them by name. And then, it's so crazy. I mean, the idea is this, which people don't understand. Rest. Uh, yeah, I'll use purple here. Remember, the King James Bible is written in Old English. And then if you look up in Old English, and look up in etymology, online, even online they have that. Look at an etymology dictionary. Look up the word rest, and then one of the first words, or if not the first word to see, is actually cease or end. Cease or end. Now look at the context. The context of verse 2 will even apparently show you it has to do with ceasing or stopping. That's what rest means. Look at verse 2. And on the seventh day, God what? Ended his work. That's very apparent. Which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day. Now notice he says rested from all his work. Did you notice that wording? Rested from all his work. See, he stopped. That, the context, the wording is, is that he stopped from his work. From all his work. That's the idea. He stopped from all his work which he had made. It's that simple. It's that simple. Okay, going to verse 3. Verse 3. So basically the atheists don't know basic English. We're going to stop here. Verse 3, I'll expound it a little bit more. Verse 3, I'll expound it a little bit more. And verse 4, I've got a very interesting teaching there. Notice that God says generations of heaven and earth. But in the, in the day, single, he had made. What does that mean? Ooh, I'll tell you next time. But then another one. Another one. Verse 8. Garden eastward in the Eden. What is Eden? It's not the garden, actually. It's something else. What is it? Ooh, we'll cover that next time. <laughs> Verse 10 through 11. Four rivers come out from Eden. It'll show you the location. Where is it at? Ooh, we'll find out next time. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Okay. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for the teaching of your words. What an amazing book. Help us to continually grow in knowledge of the scriptures and see revelation after revelation and grow in knowledge day by day. In you, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.